Hi, welcome to the Poultry Keepers Podcast. I'm Rip Stalvey, and together with Mandolin Royal and John Gunnerman, we're your co-hosts for this show, and it's our mission to help you have a happy, healthy, and productive flock. Well, said, the self, the whole self-basting concept that Mandy just brought up, the self-buttering birds, you know, there's, there's turkeys that claim to be self-basting. That was actually a, a marketing thing for, I remember it on the shrink wrap package. I don't remember which mm-hmm. brand it was. I think it was Butterball, wasn't it? It might've been. And Butterball used but the dwarfism gene. would they have done gene. that through brine injection? Or the through the dwarfism gene, I believe that was okay. done. Now, most commercial poultry off the shelf, if you read the label very carefully, it'll say may or can contain up to a whatever percent brine. It's usually 5%, I think, is yeah. the yeah. cutoff. Yeah. So for the that's doing a lot of things, but it's basically giving you salt water and charging you meat prices for it because you're paying by the ounce. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they just soak them in it, and other times they do injections. It could be injected. And then- yeah. Depending on your brands and if it was sold as whole or parts, it might be there for preservation's sake, depending on the market it's going to. I'm not going to call out the brand, but there is a brand that has 17 different flavorizers, tenderizers, preservatives, and flavors. And I'm like, why do you have to put 17 different ingredients into this brine to make it taste like chicken? So it all tastes the same to the consumer. Yeah. Because the chickens they're buying today don't have any flavor to them. Well, it, it changed the color of the bird even. It cooked up a little almost gray in color. Not like a healthy pink or white or, you know, a normal meat color. It was a little dingy looking like it got cooked in the dishwater. Oh, oh. Yeah. I, I, I got to <laughs> confess, I didn't see that one coming to folks. <laughs> well, it was cheap, so there was that going for it. <laughs> true, true. You know, we've reached the part in the show where we're going to get into specific cooking and all that stuff. And with John being a professional chef and Mandy always being up to her her elbows. And, and I think the best thing for me to do is just shut up and turn the show over to you guys. So y'all got the floor. Carry on. <laughs> well, Mandy pretty much cooks heritage poultry exclusively. I don't have that luxury being in a commercial kitchen environment all our poultry comes in through the mainline suppliers well it's, i've had one cornish cross store-bought bird to eat in the last eight years and i only went and got one to do a little comparison because i didn't want to grow my own it, it to me it was heartbreaking to grow them and even though they're faster cheaper i'm so used to seeing the way normal chickens run that i, I can't watch them grow so cooking wise it's all been heritage with various levels of success based off of breed growth rate and probably the worst chicken i ever had was when i didn't know about aging so that very first bird we cooked if we had made our decision off of that first bird we probably wouldn't even eat chicken anymore i mean it was terrible it was right smack in the middle of rigor morris when i threw that sucker in the oven and it was like a gym shoe it, it, you start what processing about, day, the very first bird goes on the grill. While it's, if you get it when it's super fresh, you're fine. And then you got to wait a while. It no needs way. to be like within an hour or less from walking around chicken to cooking that chicken. You've got to be mm-hmm. fast. You know, I remember watching Julia Childs back in the 1970 mumble somethings. And when she was working with chicken, she would always have the, the carcass on the bench in front of her. And you notice she was moving the legs around that lets you know she when was it's talking. ready after going through culinary school and everything that lets you know that the rigor mortis either hasn't started yet or it's subsided and mm-hmm. you're not going to get a tough bird you need to get full mobility out of all of the limbs before you cook it if it holds up a little bit that's going to translate to a much tougher texture than you want yes. and it does definitely change the flavor because ultimately the rigor mortis is the buildup of lactic acid in the muscle tissues mm-hmm. and fibers. And that it's an acid. So it is going to change the flavor profile of the meat. It's going to acidify the meat slightly until it dissipates. 
So another reason why you, it's not going to hurt you in any way, but it, it will change the flavor. Now, how long you age the birds, that can vary based on the bird and what your cooking goals are. And there's also little details that you can tweak to find out what methods that you prefer. So I go for a four-day age, and I do it inside of the shrink bag. I don't pull them out and air dry them because you get different results, like just those little nuances of variation. If you, some people will do a cooler of ice water with salt and they'll leave the birds in there for 24 to 48 hours. And then after that, they do what they do with them after that. But we like to do a brief soak with salted water, but not enough for it to actually brine them. And we usually have them dried off and back into a shrink bag the same day that we processed. And then we'll do a four day age at refrigerator temperatures. But if you want to get super fancy with it, you dry off the bird and put it in a refrigerator to dry uncovered for up to like 10 days. Or a hand sewn linen sack. Yeah, if you wanted super fancy, you can sew them in. If you want to really do the whole breast thing. Well, that actually happens under compression too. Mm -hmm. And it helps press their developed fat into the meat a little more. We haven't gotten that fancy with it, but that's what they do overseas in France. I got a question. You're talking about compressed fat. And I'm, I'm just asking because I've never done this, okay? But does the vacuum bag that you're putting those birds in have the same effect as sewing them up in a linen sack? Potentially, but no one has... It Study would have that. the compression, but it would not have the air what we flow. Call air chilling. The 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 air exchange it, it creates uh, something called a pedicle. It's it's like a protein layer over the top of the skin, and that will actually wow, we're we're gonna dive really, really deep here. I don't know if <laughs> Go for it, John. You're on a roll, son. Let's let's just say there's a pellicle layer that's formed, and that is very helpful in the future for flavor when the Maillard reaction occurs and caramelization happens on the meat. That pellicle really comes alive and brings a lot of flavor, and it's also very sticky and clingy to just things floating in the air. It'll definitely pick up flavors from your refrigerator, but it'll also work great for a dry brine later. And there's a difference between dry brine and wet brine, and I don't know if we're going to get there today. We're supposed yeah. to. It's on the list. Okay. Well, we talked about aging, and during the aging, that's when you would want to start thinking about brines or rubs, and then the type of salt even matters for that. Definitely. And table salt is the fastest to absorb and bring about a salty result. So if you're doing a 24-hour kind of brine, you don't want to use the table salt. Rather use kosher salt. Because the the way that it gets absorbed is different. Maybe John Moore's no, maybe John knows more of the science about that than I do. Well, it's a different uh, particle, which dissolves quicker. But ultimately, it's just NaCl. There, there is a very good. I do want to give a shout out to StellaCulinary.com. They they've got a great chart for um, different brine and resting times, and they they actually recommend a chicken breast be. Now, this is commercial crosses, you brine for four to six hours and then come out, rinse off the, the chicken and let it rest for two to four hours to equalize. Otherwise, you get a high buildup of the salts on the outside and it doesn't, you know, they, your first bite could be very salty, whereas you get into the middle of the chicken and it's not very flavored. Oh, yeah, that's true. You know, but they've, they've got a good page that describes the different uh, brining techniques. And the most important thing is making sure your salt content is correct because a little bit too much is not a good thing. Just like a little too little is not a good thing either. You, you got a very tight window. John, I will say that the brine recipe that you gave me when we cooked our heritage turkey, that bird turned out really, it would have turned out great. If I had lowered my temperature in my smoker a little bit, but it kind of got away from me for a little while. So it was a little bit dried out. Mm -hmm. But man, that bird had great flavor. Of course, I like smoked anything, but uh, sure. it, it really picked up the smoke flavor well, too. And Thank once you, you understand that. the process, you can change the flavor profile any way you want. As long as it's pulling in the salty water, 
you can bring in any spices and flavors along with it. Well, you had suggested that, and I thought, I don't really think I want to do that because I wanted to get the flavor of the bird itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I could tinker around around with spices and flavorings and herbs and all that kind of stuff, but later. Yeah. But I, I, I usually just grab a whole big pint jar of vegetable base, better than bullion, veg base, and mix that up as my brine solution because it's got everything in there that I love. There, there's a nice little pro tip. Yeah, good tip there. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Take that and mix it into enough water. It doesn't need to be like the flavor you'd expect a soup to be. In fact, you don't want it that strong. No. Hmm. Yeah. With the older birds, they have so much of their own flavor. You don't have to overdo it and drown them in spices to get something out of them. Less is more when it comes to the older birds. There is something about baking soda as part of a tenderizing brine. Mm -hmm. That was the new I was looking at. We've tried it a couple times and I noticed the biggest difference when we were doing like chicken tenders and stuff in the air fryer that way. And then, oh, what was that other thought I just had? Oh, buttermilk. I was just about to give a yeah. shout out yeah. to my favorite. Yeah. Well, my grandmother know. used butter, buttermilk a lot. Yes. And that is a beautiful thing because uh, it helps denature the protein. The acidity in the buttermilk mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing. And if you don't have buttermilk, plain yogurt works great as well. It's the same thing. Yeah. Once you start getting into the science of the different ingredients and the reason that they're in there, there there's so many options and flavor profiles that you can start playing around with. There, like chicken doesn't have to taste the same every time you have it. And then but once no, you have to cook, there's and, a lot to do with it. Yeah. So in, in this case, we've got malolactic, malolactic acid denaturing the protein. That's basically the acid that's in the buttermilk. Yeah. You can't go wrong with a good buttermilk, Brian. No. Oh, one of my favorite restaurants in the whole wide world, Gus's in Memphis, Tennessee. They, they say their secret recipe is no secret. They soak it over buttermilk, fry it the next day. Is it, see, there's tubs. Every night, they just load up the tubs and fill them with buttermilk. And the next morning, they come out, dry them off, bread them and fry them. Keep Did it we simple. talk yet about the cooking methods versus the age of birds? I don't think we really spent much time on that. We did no. not. Yeah, I think you should that, do that's that. That's huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of important. So, <laughs> for example, a fryer, if you're going to fry chicken from raw, that bird needs to be young. It needs to be less than 14 weeks old. And that's just because of the texture of the meat. It changes as they start maturing. So, yeah, you could take your Cornish cross and fry them for morale easy peasy. But the others, you really want to know how old that bird is. Because otherwise, you might need to poach them a little bit and do some pre-cooking with them. And then fry them. You can make it kind of a double process to use older chicken. I was playing around with that and had pretty good results doing it that way. Well, that's pretty why most of the recipes from the old cookbooks, 1950s and earlier, actually specify the age and type of chick. For this recipe, use a roaster or a broiler because the, the age is paired to the cooking technique. Yeah. You know, hot and fast or low and slow, so to speak. Yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it, really. And yeah, you the younger gotta, the bird you, you is, almost have to treat it like a red meat. Yeah, exactly like that. It's either just like cooking a steak. It's either hot and fast or low and slow, like a pot roast. And in between, you've got shoe leather, or at least in my yeah. opinion. That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> I usually, after about 18 weeks of age, I default back to the low and slow. And that has always given a pretty good result and i consider low to be less than 350 degrees once you in get a, i think in a dutch oven oh yeah yeah i need to get a new one of those mandy i got a question for you and maybe john too but i know mandy processes a ton and a half of chickens but <laughs> um, do you, excuse me do you write the age of the bird on the bag only if it's outside of my normal range. 
So if it's younger than our tip, because normally it's 16 to 18 weeks. So if it's blank, I know it's there. If it's over 20 weeks, I make a note of that because there's some cooking options that are off limits. I can't fry it from raw. I can't grill it from raw. So like when we grill a bird, the best results I've gotten is to take that bird whole and spatchcock it and then put it in the oven at, you know, 200, 225 and treat that bird like a rack of ribs. And only put it on that grill at the very end for maybe 12 minutes just to pick up the flavor of being grilled, but rely on the oven for the cooking process. Guys, how about explain what spatchcocking is? Because some of our listeners may not be familiar with that term. Pretty much when you cut the spine out and then flip it over, give it one hard press like you're doing CPR on it, and that kind of flattens out the whole bird. You get a more even cooking result that way because you're eliminating that interior cavity. If you've ever seen a pressed duck in the window of an Asian market, that's the same thing. We're just butterflying the whole thing out. But that that allows the heat to access the meat better. You know, Things heating up like, heating a flat thing on a grill is a lot more efficient than heating a oh round yeah. thing on oh a grill, yeah. especially if it's got a big cavity in the middle. Seems like I saw, and I uh, help me out here. I could be dead wrong in saying this, but I saw some recipes where they spatchcocked a chicken and then wrapped a brick in aluminum foil and laid that on top of the chicken to cook it in a Dutch oven to press it down while it's cooking. Yes. Would you get a brick mark? <laughs> well, I think it, first off, I think as long as your brick is clean to begin with, you don't need to wrap it in aluminum foil. But I, I do play a little hazardous with my cooking. <laughs> as long as it's in a Dutch oven, any of the fats and juices that are pressed out are going to be recaptured in the, the pot liquor or the, the sauce mm -hmm. that's created. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. I would be concerned about any sort of weight on a grill because all those fat and juices are going to fall down to the fire, cause right, flare-ups, right. and that's generally a bad thing. Now, I, I was just wondering if that method would make the flesh dry. Potentially. Depends I, on what's under it. Yeah. You know, I don't recall. I just remember seeing this aluminum foil-wrapped brick laying on this chicken carcass in the Dutch oven. Okay. But that's that's been a while back, so. You know what? Maybe Let's they try. didn't do that CPR move to... Could be. Keep it flat. Because if you don't do that, it'll kind of want to revert back to its shape. You yeah, really when, just won't pound it one time. When you're doing the spatchcock, you really got to push down until everything cracks. Just like doing CPR effectively, if you're not cracking ribs, you're not saving lives. That's what they tell us class. <laughs> I've never heard it put that way. Yeah, I've heard that before. It, it's true. I mean, you almost, you have to break ribs to do CPR correctly just about. But the the same thing. It's just a matter of getting all that surface exposed and not having these undulations. And cook it a meat side down first, flesh side down. So when you flip it, now you've got the skin, which can crisp and caramelize and basically create a self-containing bowl for all those juices and meat to cook inside of. I don't, I, you're talking about the crisping of the skin? Yeah. I can remember my grandmother's fried chicken was so good. I, I would always pull the skin off, set that aside, and save that for last because it was so darn good. Well, and to get that kind of result, there's very particular methods to follow to get that crispiness. And I found it's a little bit of a ballet to get an even crispness, and it starts with drying the bird off. So, like, if you packed them wet, and you cooked it wet and you kept it covered, you're going to end up with like more rubbery, not crispy skin. Like there, there's a lot that has to happen to the science to get that result. There's a, there's a mnemonic crispy. that I use to remember that in culinary schools, dry, wet, dry. So you start yeah. with a dry bird and then you put a dry coating on it. And then if you're going to use an intermediary, like an egg, it's wet and then dry again, your final coating. But you're always putting dry to wet or vice versa. You're never putting a wet coating on top of a wet bird or a dry coating on top of a dry bird. Oh, vice that makes versa. sense. And cornstarch. So my, my base layer is almost always cornstarch. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's inexpensive and I always have some on hand, but it creates a great surface for other things to stick to later on. So the very first time I was going to try fried chicken for the, I mean, this is an embarrassing story, but I'm going to tell it anyways. <laughs> it's never stopped us before, Mandy. So. What? <laughs> So you know how when you open up a recipe off the Google and they go through their entire life story and all the things that have nothing to do and you just go, give me the recipe. And I saw the button to skip to recipe. So I tap that button. There's all my ingredients. I get everything out. I measure it. I put everything in the one bowl. And then I start putting the, I go to stir this kind of look like pancake batter and it wouldn't stick. And it started turning into dough. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? This is not going to do fried chicken. Because I failed to read the very important instructions that your wets go with your wets and your dry goes with your dry. And you dredge it and you do this whole thing. And I had just taken all those ingredients and put them all in the same bowl. And uh, it didn't even work for bread when I was like, I'll just bake it this way and see if I can make croutons out of this and not waste everything in there. But yeah, instead of doing a wet bowl and a dry bowl and doing the chicken for fried chicken, I ended up with this big ball of dough. Wasn't good for anything. <laughs> so the big takeaway here is technique is important and follow instructions. Technique and read the important parts of the recipe. Get the life story, but definitely go and look for those important little tidbits on how, you know, two different bowls. Yeah, but sadly, they they embed those little tidbits throughout their story. So you got to read the whole dang story to get the good stuff. Or or get actual cookbooks that were from the period <laughs> that are working with the items you're going to be cooking. And you get your clear and concise instructions with some mm-hmm. nuance in there of some of the historical methods and uh, figure it out from there. <laughs> But I think when it comes to chicken, it's pretty much 1950s or earlier. If you're doing heritage birds, those are the recipes you want to be following with. Yes. Or pick yourself up a reprint of the Escoffier cookbook in English, if you can find it. It's definitely preferred. I mean, that's what every culinary school student and classically trained chef has been traumatized by. But those, those, that's how. To cook, literally. And it'll specify, you know, age and preparation. Just like, you know, the old, uh, what is it? Better Homes and Gardens, the red and white checkerboard covered book. If you get an early enough one. Or oh, better. That, Betty yeah. Crocker cookbook. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have those on the shelves. We got the Betty Crocker, Franny Farmer. They, they all have these old recipes and techniques in them still. So keep your eye out at yard sales. Uh, A lot of libraries are cleaning out their shelves and they're just putting these out for free. Grab them. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great way to cook, pick up a cookbook, but it's, it's a shame in the sense that it's not going to benefit very many people. Yeah. But, but, you know, they looked at, you know, when was the last time this book was taken out? Oh, 1984. Is it really relevant? You know, we need to, we need shelf space. Heard oh, it. I know. I know. You know, everybody's into molecular gastronomy now. How do I get, you know, foams and bubbles and stuff in my food? So that's what's hot and popular now. Well, I'm sorry, but I'd rather have a nice piece of fried chicken than I had a spoonful of foam. Yeah. Well, maybe at some point someone will do the book called, oh, what can we call it? The Homesteader's Guide to Cooking Heritage Chicken. There you go. <laughs> I think that's a someone really good that. project for you and John. Uh, my list is too long already. <laughs> oh, come on now. Give it a pro. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you guys like to lay on us before we go? Uh, oh, wow. goodness. I wish we had audience for questions. but I know. This would be a good show for that. So, well. You got. Maybe they'll email yeah, the pre-1950s. us. Pre-1950s. Like Mandy said, if you have a question or comment, we'd love to hear from you with a quick email and just let us know what it is. Mm -hmm. But I do want to put out, I I mentioned a document, stellaculinary.com. It's called the Mm -hmm. science behind brining. So if you go to stellaculinary.com slash brine, just type that in. S-T-E-L-L-A? S-T-E-L-L-A, culinary, C-U-L-I-N-A-R-Y.com slash brine. We've got a great video 
by Jacob Burton, who explains it very, very well. And they go into a lot of the different science behind osmosis and air diffusion and salt diffusion and levels. And I highly recommend that document. It's all there in one place and it's described better than I can here. Excellent advice, John. I appreciate that. And I'm, as soon as we stop recording, I'm probably going to go look that rascal up. Yeah, I probably will too. <laughs> so until next time, we thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy your birds and have fun with them. And now after this show, maybe cook up one or two. I don't know. I, but Go out there and find the weakest link. There you go. You got to eat them to save them when you're breeding absolutely. heritage poultry. Thank you for joining us this week. And before you go, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you can receive new episodes right when they're released. And they're released every Tuesday. If you're enjoying this podcast, we'd like to ask you to drop us an email at poultrykeeperspodcast at gmail.com and share your thoughts about the show. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of the Poultry Keepers Podcast. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.